how can the Voyagers still be running perfectly if our cell phones can't even last a day? It's been nearly 50 years since the legendary space probes launched, yet they respond effectively and efficiently every time they're called upon. So, how does NASA do this? And what's the technology behind it that common people don't have access to? The Voyagers are one of humanity's greatest achievements. These spacecraft have done it all and helped us see the universe in ways we could have never imagined. As the most traveled man-made objects in history, they've explored outer planets like Jupiter, Saturn, and Neptune, capturing images and magical space moments all along the way. They gave us our first view of the solar system's family portrait, making it a significant milestone not only for scientists, but for the human race as a whole. All of these remarkable achievements are down to the high-tech components and instruments installed on the space probes. The Voyager spacecraft uses a 23-watt radio, which is 3 watts higher than what a typical cell phone uses. On one hand, this is impressive given that the spacecraft was developed in the 1970s, but it's nonetheless a low-level transmitter. Hence, the Voyager spacecraft have to combine a number of techniques and instruments to get the job done. Perhaps the most important asset in its locker is the 3.7-meter high-gain antenna, aka HGA. This antenna is not just sophisticated, it's also bigger than the typical large satellite dish you see in your neighborhood. And even though both Voyager spacecraft are now in a different realm, their high-gain antennas are still active as they were 45 years ago. They continue to transmit scientific and engineering data back to Earth. Other instruments on board the spacecraft that are still active include the magnetometer and low-field magnetometers, which measure the magnetic fields of the Sun and the other outer planets. In 2015, this instrument helped scientists discover that solar winds can redirect the magnetic field of charged particles they encounter, even beyond the heliopause. Interestingly, the Low Energy Charged Particles instrument, which measures ions and their distribution in the solar system, helped scientists locate the heliopause itself in 1993. It continues to function at full capacity, even till today. But that's not enough. Back in the days when the probes weren't in the emptiness of the interstellar world, the spacecraft were in danger. Hence, they have a micrometeorite shield, which protects the instruments from dust and other particles that could disrupt its operations. For obvious reasons, the shield works round the clock and cannot be turned off. Next, you've got the optical calibration target, which helps to calibrate several components aboard the spacecraft, including particle instruments, infrared radio meters, and cameras. Then there are the hydrazine thrusters, which are still active as well. They help to propel and keep the craft warm. This has been used to propel the Voyager away from colliding with several planetary objects several times. And lastly, there's the Radioisotope Thermoelectric Generator, or RTG, which powers the Voyager spacecraft by converting the heat produced by plutonium-238 into electricity. Without the RTG, the Voyager spacecraft wouldn't have been able to achieve any of the things it's achieved. Each Voyager is equipped with three RTGs, which produce a combined 400 watts of energy after launch. Due to natural radioactive decay, their output has since dropped to 4 watts per year which literally means the Voyager would soon be left without a source of power. However, NASA hopes to keep it running until its 50th anniversary in 2027 by turning off some components. The instruments that are either damaged or shut down by NASA include the ultraviolet spectrometer, infrared radio meter, interferometer and spectrometer, photopolarimeter subsystem, planetary radio astronomy and plasma wave antenna. The ultraviolet spectrometer was particularly helpful in revealing the compositions of gas giants like Jupiter, Saturn, Neptune, and Uranus. Meanwhile, the iris helped scientists discover a heat source deep within Neptune. At the same time, the photopolarimeter gave us more details about the ring systems around Uranus and Neptune. Additionally, the Voyager spacecraft has a planetary radio astronomy and plasma wave antenna, which measures radio emissions from gas giants. This was used to record the radio waves from Jupiter and Saturn. But even more than the spacecraft and the scientists themselves, the most important part of every mission when it comes to communication is the Deep Space Network. The DSN is basically a collection of big radio antennas located in strategic areas around the world, separated by around 120 degrees of latitude. The primary function of the DSN is to facilitate communication between spacecraft and scientists. However, they also serve other purposes. 
For instance, it provides specific details about the spacecraft's location and how they're performing in real time. Additionally, scientists send commands to different space probes using the Deep Space Network. Currently, it's under NASA's Space Communication and Navigation Network, which includes the Near Space Network, which is basically a series of ground station networks across the world that communicate with satellites in low Earth orbit. The network was officially launched in 1963, but it had been in existence before then as part of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and the United States Army Lunar Flashlight Project, which involved developing a lunar probe. The project was eventually tweaked and launched as the Pioneer Probe when NASA came into the picture. But importantly, all the sites that had been set up were adopted into the Deep Space Network. The antennas of the network sites were initially supposed to be erected in Goldstone, California, Nigeria, and far away in the Philippines. But plans changed when scientists discovered that if they moved the sites away from the equator, they could cover activities in low Earth orbit and a wider range of latitudes. So rather than set up a base in the Philippines, they moved one of the antennas near Canberra in Australia. And rather than put one in Nigeria, a facility was set up in South Africa, but eventually relocated to Madrid. Meanwhile, the site in Goldstone, California was maintained. The location of these antennas means that we're able to track spacecraft at all times. One of the main criteria for choosing these sites is that they're located in valleys with ridges surrounding them so their signals are not jammed by straying waves. The first main antenna of this network was a 26-meter dish known as DSS-11. It helped NASA track the unsuccessful attempt of the Pioneer 3 to explore the moon. The DSS-11 was in service for just over two decades, operating between 1958 and 1981. Up next, there was the DSS-12, which is also called the ECHO due to its involvement in the ECHO space project. Nowadays, it has been expanded from 26 meters to 34 meters and moved to a new location. It is now officially known as the Goldstone Apple Valley Radio Telescope and basically only used for educational purposes. However, the oldest DSN dish is still actively operating in the DSN-14. The 64-meter antenna was built in the 1960s, but it has since been expanded to 70 meters. So how does NASA utilize the DSN infrastructure to communicate with the Voyager? Currently, the two Voyager spacecraft are well over 10 billion miles away from Earth. Considering this vast distance, it is literally a miracle that we're still able to communicate with them. But some incredible methods of science combined with the sheer power and efficiency of technology have made it possible. And it takes effort from both sides. The space explorers play their part by carrying all the necessary equipment in the right shape and form, which allows them to send signals back to the various DSN stations across the world. A typical two-way communication between NASA scientists and the Voyager spacecraft takes about 44 hours on average. This is because of the great distance between the space probes and Earth. In any case, once a signal or command is transmitted from Earth using tens of thousands of watts, it travels between 20 to 22 hours to get to the probes. After then, the signal is processed by the spacecraft and a reply is sent back to the DSN. This takes another 20 to 22 hours. By the time the DSN station receives the signals, it is less than one trillionth of a watt. Hence, the DSN antennas on Earth are equipped with highly sensitive amplifiers to enable scientists to make sense of the faint signals received from the Voyager spacecraft. In truth, our deep space data throughput capabilities have improved by 10 to the power of 13 since the project was launched back in the 90s. But scientists are constantly making upgrades on the components that make up the network. The DSN, however, is not the final destination of information received from the space probes. Rather, it acts as a processing center where the data is refined before it is sent to the Space Flight Operations Facility at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena.